everybody, and welcome back to Politically Black with Zach. And today we are talking to Daryl Terry Jr., DJ Terry II, who is running for State Senate District 38. Daryl, welcome to Politically Black. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. I'm glad that you could be here uh, with us. It is a full circle moment. 100%. And that you are a graduate of Frederick Douglass High School, uh, the Black and Gold Astro. And I used to work at Frederick Douglass High School. So it's, it's really great for us to have this chance to dialogue. I appreciate you for making time and making space in such a busy season. You are running for what I consider to be one of the state's most prominent political legacy seats. 100%. District 38 has been, uh, has been held by Horacina Tate for more than 25 years. And before that, I think her, you know, her father is a famous civil rights leader, a legacy seat. What makes you the candidate to fill those shoes and sit in that legacy seat? Well, first of all, give honor and glory to God who is ahead of my life, the, the source of my strength and from, all, from which all blessings flow. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, brother, I, I grew up and was raised in the city of Atlanta. I was raised on the west side, right on the corner of West Lake and Joseph E. Boone. We used to call it the Simpson Road. Um, and I pretty much have just kind of seen over time how this district has changed. Uh, it's a really, really large district. But I like to explain to people the history of the district, right? Leroy Johnson won this district in 1962. Um, in a 1962 election, he actually won this district, and he became one of the first, not one of, the first black senator elected to the state Senate since Reconstruction. Um, he actually went on to desegregate the Capitol. A lot of people don't know that. And so he did it silently by having his Senate pages, the young students, go into the whites-only restrooms. And the governor at the time kind of recognized that he didn't make a lot of noise, but he was making a large impact. And so what makes me kind of understand how the history of this seat goes, uh, after him was Horace Tate, you know, a dynamic superintendent, one of the first black superintendents, you know, in South Georgia and really just an amazing person. And then, of course, Ralph David Abernathy III, we know all about his father. Uh, but, of course, Ralphie came into the seat and he he made some amazing strides for the district. And then Horace Cena Tate followed right after him. Um, and, of course, we know she won her election by one vote uh, to beat Gordon Joyner to become the state senator. And so all of, a lot of these people have strong ties to the city of Atlanta to the region and, and really have to understand the history that goes into what this district is and the people that you would represent. Um, these are a lot of my friends, my neighbors, my sister, my grandma, cousins, aunties, uncles. And not only that, we, we truly understand the things that need to be done and the, thing, the things that need to be improved in the district. What is the biggest priority facing you in this district? What's the biggest, what is probably number one for you? Number one is always gonna be education. And I tell people that because I was a, I, I like to explain, I, I don't like to wear this as a badge of honor, right? This is just something that kind of goes along with my story. I was a product of, and still am a product of the APS cheating scandal. Um, and so education is always gonna be my top, <clears throat> excuse me. And so when I talk about education, I'm not just talking about education for you know middle elementary high school students i'm talking about all the way through um we have to focus primarily on making sure that pre-k is required people don't realize in georgia pre-k and kindergarten are not required uh we have to make sure that we focus on our reading levels at third grade because 42 percent of our kids are reading on a grade level and that's lower than 50 percent so less than half of our half percentage of our kids are reading on grade level that's a problem and we got to do something to address it. So not only am I trying to tackle education, I, I have a plan. It's called D-Plan. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It's called D-Plan. The pollen is out of control. It's I affecting know. me, too. Like, it's just, it's everywhere. It's so killing me. It's this, killing me. this has been happening to me, too, throughout the my day. My allergies are really bad. But I, it, I have a, my platform is called D-Plan. And it's, it's an acronym for Transportation, Healthcare, and Education. The reason I say that is because all three of those factors we touch on a daily basis in our life, right? Transportation, you got to use the roads. We use the roads to get here right, to get to where we're going, to get to school, to get to work, all of that, we have to make sure that our multimodal, multimodal systems of transportation are working in the proper way and are designed to be efficient and effective for everybody. Healthcare, we gotta get a high, uh, uh, we have to, have to, have to get a hospital emergency room below I-20. 
We have to. We have to. And we have to expand Medicaid. And I don't think people understand what that means, right? We have a plan. So there's plan A and then there's plan B. Plan A would cover 300,000 people and we can draw down $1.5 trillion from the federal government to help pay for it. But then you have the governor's plan, which is plan B. And that's only going to cover about 32,000 people, but it's going to cost us a significantly higher amount of money. We have to focus on making sure our health care outcomes for our people are better. And not only our people, and when I say our people, you got to realize District 38 is made up of about 120,000 black people out of the 195,000 people that's in the district. So we got to make sure that we're looking out for everybody, minorities. It is a strongly minority majority district. Uh, we have, I was at Duncan Park this morning in Fairburn. You have people from all walks of life, Hispanic, Latinx, um, Asian American. You, you have so many different uh, groups and a melting pot of people that we have to look out for. And, you know, it's really reassuring to hear you say that. And, you know, what we call it in education is uh, talking about education from cradle to college. Absolutely. Cradle to college. And then when you look at the third grade reading levels and why they are so low, it goes back to cradle. It's yes. not just what happens when a no. child gets in kindergarten. You it's have late. children who are being exposed to 50,000 words from birth to age three. And then you have some kids who are exposed to only 5,000 words. And so you're combating and trying to bridge gaps that exist. And you can't do that in one, two, or three years of primary education. It really is something that has to start and get addressed at the cradle yep. in the community work that we have happening or that should be <clears throat> happening all around in our communities. You talked about the expansion of health care in Georgia, Plan A and Plan B. I personally thought that 2024 would be the year, but we just found out that House Bill, I want to say it was, is it 1078 or 1088? House Bill, I think it was, uh, let me verify my notes so, I, that, so that I'm accurate. Uh, House Bill 1077 went down in flames. It did. It didn't cross. We thought it was going to cross over. We thought we would get uh, the, the we, we thought finally that we're going to get an expansion of, you know, health care services in the state of Georgia, but it didn't make it across. What do you think will be different in the 2025 legislative session if you are put in office? I mean, Senator Kowser said this. He specifically said that we have to give the governor's plan another year. And I don't believe that we should make people who are dying every day another year to wait for their health care, to have access to affordable health care. That should be a right. You shouldn't have to explain or, or have your government stand in the way of you receiving uh, health care that's going to help people where we're from. And so I'll say it like this. I truly believe that personality has gotten in the way of that bill passing this year. Um, I think it's important for our state senators to be present, speak up, and speak out for what we believe in. And it has to be said that we have to do something about health care outcomes, not only just for our people. Women, maternal mortality outcomes, health outcomes, are some of the worst in the nation, right? We have kids who are going to school and not receiving the proper screenings for, in order to make sure that they're going to be healthy. And then we want to talk about workforce, the problem with our workforce is because we don't invest in our people as we should, right? And I, I, I like to use myself as an example. My entire education was paid for by the state of Georgia. The entire one. So from pre-K all the way to I got my, my degree from Georgia Tech, it was paid for by the state of Georgia. And that is a possibility for so many kids out there. They just have to be able to understand that they can access it. It's a, it's a possibility and a promise. If, Absolutely. If they, again, if they know how to um, access it. You, you brought up some really great points. And, you know, Daryl, one of the great things about you is that you really are, you, you know, you are Atlanta. Thank you me. are the, the promise of this city, you know, brought to, brought to life. Like, you are the promise of Atlanta. You are what we older people who go into education, what we hope to see from the students that we work with and, and what matriculates through, through our systems. What... Can do you say to continue that with other young people? Because one of the biggest issues, you know, you're not the first person to talk about this need for health care. I was right. very committed and invested in the Abrams campaign. Okay. And I thought that her push to expand Medicaid, Medicare in the state of Georgia was going to be what would carry her through, and it didn't happen. In your district, it's gonna be about mobilizing voters to come out for you. Right. How are you gonna make that happen? 
You got to realize, man, it's a really big district. I mean, it's 195,000 people. I have well over 35,000 people who consistently vote on a consistent basis. And so I think making sure that I spread my message, making sure that I tell people about my platform, helping people to understand that if I'm elected, I would become the first Gen Z state senator in the history of the state of Georgia. And I'm a black man who was raised in the hood on the west side of Atlanta. That has to be, that has to mean something, right? That has to mean something to somebody that comes from homelessness, as somebody that comes from hard work and just really truly going through the process and understand that at the end of the day, if you stick to your plan, you will be, you will, you will end up where you want to be. I have to be able to spread that message and let people know about our, our, our campaign. I mean, one thing that I really kind of focus on in our campaign is helping people understand that there is an ability for changes to happen, right? And it's, it might not be large changes. It can be incremental. Increasing LMIG funds, which pay for our roads and our infrastructure. Letting people know that the 285 and 20 interchange is about to take 10 years to change. And they're about to redo it, right? Helping people understand why there was one lane changes made on Donnelly Hollowell, which we used to know as, as Bankhead, to increase pedestrian safety. It's still safety. Bankhead to me. Yeah, that's it's what I'm saying. Simpson Road is still Simpson Road to me, so. Because that's where we're from. Right. We're here. You, you have to realize that <laughs> even though you might change the name, that culture and that energy of people who we'll love our change. city, it's never going to change, right? And I, I, I wear it as a badge on. People ask me all the time, you don't never want to move, you don't never want to leave. Michael Bond said this. He said, if Atlanta didn't exist... I would dream of her. That's, that's how a powerful. That's statement. how powerful yeah. our city and I agree is, with, man. I agree with you. So, what do you say to the people telling people to, you know, we fool don't come here? Because <laughs> that's one of my angry. I really get angry when I hear that, right? Because it's black people saying it. Right. We're perpetuating it on social media. You don't hear other communities saying it. Right. They're saying the opposite. Come to Atlanta. We have jobs for you at Google. We have jobs for you at Facebook. We have jobs for you. Uh, you know, come. Yes. We, we have houses that you can take over. We have things you can steal. Absolutely. Come to Atlanta. But black people are like, I oh, don't come here. And as we do that, we are seeing the power of the black community dilute. We're seeing uh, voting change. And then we're seeing people get put into office like what you're running for. Mm -hmm hurt the black community absolutely. because the people who safeguarded those things are no longer there. So what do you say to those who say, don't come? We're not full. And I mean, I, 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 I like to tell people we're not full. I, I, I think the problem is people have difficulty recognizing the new Atlanta, right? Mm, what do you mean by the new Atlanta? Tell us about the new, from what, how you see the new Atlanta. The new Atlanta is a more diverse, more inclusive, more equitable city that Andy Young and Maynard Jackson and all those great names fought for in the 70s and the 80s, right? They had this idea that we could use the power of the black family to elect a black man to put in policies to make a city that is more equitable for all. And in turn, what we didn't realize is that we may be pushing some of our own people out in the process, right? Not intentionally, but over time, it started to change. Right. And so people say, well, we're full because the roads are clogged and congested or we're full because there's an apartment complex going up the street from your home. We're not full. We have extreme need for density in our city. We have extreme need for affordable housing in our city. And that is a state issue. It is a state. issue. People don't realize that there's this thing called preemption to where the state says, if you want to have a, a affordable housing policies in your city, we're not going to allow you to do that. The state. That's a state issue. So we have to allow you to create policies that are tenant friendly and make it to where people can actually afford to live in a place that they want to live in. So for anybody out there watching this who are who have said to themselves, this is a candidate who I can believe in and I am 100 percent wanting to see, you know, DJ Terry on, you know, in that seat. What can they do to help you join the team? Human capital is is amazingly supportive, right? If you cannot donate, if you cannot uh, show up to events, just feel free to call us and see how you can help out, right? We, we need your help. We need your support. You can, we have a campaign office right on MLK. We're accessible. We can drop you off at the, uh, the Westlake train station, right? Or we can give you a ride home if you live pretty close. We want people to join our campaign for one reason. That's because they love not only the city of Atlanta, but the region, right? District 38 is made up of six cities. Sandy Springs, Atlanta, South Fulton, Union City, Fairburn, and Palmetto. That is amazing. Ray, repeat it. Your <laughs> I'll slow down. state Senate District 38 
which used to primarily be, I think you is what well, you said, the Chattahoochee. So it straddled the Chattahoochee. Straddled Chattahoochee. Smyrna, Atlanta, South Fulton. On just the a West little bit down. Yeah. But now it's become a six city span, like a little strip. A baking strip. That the that congressional Republicans yep. redistricted and re- redrew. State. State level Republicans. State level Republicans redrew yep. this and gave you what six cities again? So I have Sandy Springs. I go from the foothills of Sandy Springs down through Buckhead, everything west of Roswell Road. I go over and pick up Lennox. I come down Northside Drive, hitting Upper West Side, Northside Drive, and then I jump all the way down to uh, Howell Station. The the Rice Street Jail, which is very near and dear to my heart, is in the district. And then you go all the way down through Southwest Atlanta. So you have Peyton Forest, Shallow Woods, Florida Heights, over to Beecher, all the way down through District 11, Cascade Road, Greenbrier, where I live. Um, and then you come over into South Fulton. So you have South Fulton, all the way down South Fulton, Butner all Road. All the way down to Palmetto. Yeah. All the, I'm, I'm Fairburn, believable. Union City. Huge, man. 195,000 residents, 69 precincts, six cities. That is going to be massive. But, yes. and it's going to be, you know, quite quite the showdown to see. There is no, is there a Republican challenger? There is no Republican. There is no, so whoever wins on May 21st yes. is going to have the Senate seat and will be a part of the 2025 legislative session. Absolutely. You know, in the state of Georgia. Do you have, who, who do you identify, Daryl, as my last question for you, as your political role models? Well, you got to understand, I came up through the city of Atlanta government. So uh, Michael Bond gave me my first opportunity to serve in his office at 14. Uh, so I had to start off with Michael Bond. Uh, he, understanding what his father went through, not being seated in the Georgia legislature because he was a black man. Um, learning from him and kind of crafting my political role has, has been amazing. Keisha Lance Bottoms, she gave me my opportunity when I was in college. Uh, and then, of course, my my current uh, role model and boss, Councilman Byron Amos. Uh, he, the content of his character is so amazing because he stayed in contact with me through, from high school when they were trying to close Douglas. I went down to the board and spoke and we had a conversation ever since when then. When he was a board member. Absolutely. Yep. We stayed in contact. And to give me the opportunity to come back and run his office at the age of 25 is is unheard of, Right. And so I think those people, I mean, I could, I could run off a list. The mayor, when he was working at Georgia Tech, Andre Dickens, he gave me the ability to come to Georgia Tech. I'll tell you that story later. Um, all, all of those guys who, who are kind of now stepping into leadership roles, they identified, they helped me to understand what to do. Well, they in saw in you yeah. a good leader. That's what an investment is. Yeah. That's why Atlanta is such a, a beautiful, shining city on the hill. It's because... Where in the world do we invest in our kids like that? And then have our kids come and run for the Senate at 26. Where they see the investment pay off yeah. in terms of continued service to the people. Absolutely. Well, Daryl, thank you so much, my friend, for making time and space. And I can't wait to see you win this on May 21st. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right.